I will get us started. All right. Well, good evening, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Rizzy Black Alumni Association event this evening. Um, what are we up to? Uh, my name is Vincent Brathwaite. I am an 05 ID grad and currently the director of the Design Leadership Forum at Envision. It is a private and diverse community of over 3,000 global design leaders. And I would like to introduce you to our guest for the evening, Kelly Walters. But before I do, I do want to make a note and just let everyone know that this uh, event and this discussion tonight is being recorded. Um, and uh, we will not be recording the more informal discussion session that will happen post this uh, conversation and Q&A session that we will have with Ms. Kelly Walters. Uh, so just wanted to let you know that. And if you do not feel comfortable with uh, your face uh, being recorded, uh, you can go ahead and um, you know put your, your image up uh, or your name up and take yourself off of video. But if you are okay, with it, with yourself being uh, recorded, then we're all good. All right. Uh, with that being said, uh, Ms. Kelly Walters, at MFA uh, 15 graphic design graduate, is an artist, designer, educator, researcher, and the founder of Bright Polka Dot. Her practice includes teaching, writing, and experimental publishing with a particular focus on race and representation in design. Her ongoing design research integrates uh, the complexities of identity formation, systems of value, and the shared vernacular in and around Black visual culture. Kelly has worked as a designer for SF MoMA, the RISD Museum, Alexander Isley Inc., Designers, and Blue State. In 2015, she completed her MFA in graphic design from the Rhode Island School of Design. She was awarded an Association of Independent Colleges of Art and Design AICAD Teaching Fellowship in Graphic Design Program at California College of the Arts from 2015 to 2016. She has previously taught at the University of Bridgeport, Rhode Island School of Design, University of Connecticut and Central St. Martins. She is currently an Assistant Professor of Communication Design and the Associate Director of the BFA Communication Design Program at Parsons School of Design in New York. Without further ado, I would like to welcome Ms. Kelly Walters. Thanks, Vincent. Um, <laughs> you did the long bio. <laughs> let me see. I did. Camera. I did. Why not? Uh, let me share my screen. Uh, let's see. Okay. Can you see this? Does it show notes? Yes. So perfectly, right? Just the screen. Um, yep. Okay, great. Uh, so thank you everybody who's here. Uh, I see Bethany, um, my former program director of the uh, GD MFA program here at RISD, um, and Iana, shout out to Iana who's also here. Um, I am really excited to share um, some of the work that I've done uh, as a student while I was at RISD and also kind of how it's informed uh, much of what I'm still doing um, and continuing to do in my practice today. Um, so I'm, again, really grateful for the invitation and always excited to come back and, and share what I'm up to. Um, so with that, I'll just kind of bring us back to about 2014 um, when I was a grad student uh, at RISD. And one of the seminal projects that I worked on as a graduate student um, was called Kindred. And so uh, my time at RISD was 2013 to 2015. Um, in the graphic design MFA program, I was um, really excited to be sort of working with other designers and working in an art context at that time, just coming back to school. And one of the things that I was kind of coming up against and navigating um, was kind of really thinking about what it, meant, what, what it meant to be Black um, in the RISD space and in the RISD community. Um, one of the projects that I worked on, uh, not realizing how kind of critical it would become later, um, was an exhibition that I co-curated called Kindred. And uh, this was an exhibition that I worked in collaboration with Tia Blasengame, who at the time was a grad student in printmaking. And we applied to, um, you know, the, the Gelman Gallery sort of exhibition space to propose an exhibition. 
And uh, one of the things that we were thinking about were kind of how our work was intersected um, just in terms of thinking about um, blackness or black representation. Um, Tia was sort of exploring it in one way, I was exploring it in another way in the graphic design context. Um, but together we sort of came together and thought about how could we create an exhibition um, that featured the work of other students across RISD, um, regardless of discipline, um, that identified as being black um, and of the African diaspora. And so uh, I would say between 2014 into 2015, um, the show was up. Uh, we were able to really sort of feature uh, a range of work, as you can see here, these are all kind of uh, student works that are installed in the, the Gelman Gallery space from sculpture to um, printmaking to uh, photography um, and watercolor even. And so I, I found this project to be really challenging, but also really rewarding. Uh, one, because it gave me an opportunity to see who was on campus, um, where, the, where the Black artists and designers were in, and across our, our RISD community. Uh, I was also exposed to different ways of making. People were kind of creating works um, in a more sculptural context. I uh, was inspired by that. This image on the screen here um, are a set of posters I actually made for uh, my one of my studio courses in the graphic design program. Um, and it ended up being kind of installed inside of the show as well. And I, I show this project because um, the pieces that came out of it you know, were at one point um, somewhat templated that you, if you propose a show, you kind of go into the space and there's sort of like a, a pretty, you know, specific system of, you know, curating an exhibition and putting it uh, into the gallery space. But I think in working with Tia, we were really interested in pushing beyond just the installation of the show, um, but thinking about how we could actually bring designers and artists who were featured in the exhibition uh, together in a symposium. And so we did like a one day evening sort of night of talks um, and presentations by select designers in the show. And this image on the screen uh, is just a few, um, few of the different individuals who, you know, spoke uh, about their experience being Black, that spoke about their experience being um, at RISD and the challenges that were kind of, um, we were in encountering during our time there. And, uh, and it was through this work, realizing that it's not just the exhibition, but that I could also think about the design of space and environment and voices and bringing people together. Um, it, and it also thought, it made me think about um, how we could imprint this as kind of like, because this is a temporal, uh, artifact in a way, right, that an exhibition is fleeting, it kind of comes and it goes. How can you sort of have a, um, a document, if you will, of um, something that kind of represents the time in that moment? And so I worked um, to develop the, the, the publication for the exhibition, and inside were uh, all of the different artworks that were featured in the exhibition. Um, there were artist statements from all of the students who were also featured in the show. And uh, shout out to Tony, who is also here because we got money from the Intercultural Student Engagement Office to produce this publication. Um, so again, I think, you know, what was really seminal for me was like reaching out to different areas of, of RISD to sort of support um, the kind of extension of this project in all kinds of ways. And so I, uh, I just start here mostly to kind of demonstrate and share um, how critical through working through this project, it really informed my interest in publishing, it really informed my interest in exhibition design. And then, you know, when I left RISD and kind of went off into the world, again, <laughs> um, you know, there were freelance projects that were coming up that were kind of centered around my interests. Um, I was at the time uh, working in California and San Francisco at CCA. And one of the projects uh, that I was invited to kind of create was the visual identity for an exhibition called The Black Woman is God. And over the last like four or five years, I've worked through kind of iterating on um, the, the identity for this particular exhibition uh, that was curated by Melora Green and Karen Senefero. 
And so the, the opportunity to sort of support and be more on the background of a designer that's um, sharing and, you know, bringing in what, what I have as a designer to other artists who are actually creating their own exhibitions was just something that I really liked doing. And I felt like it was important for me uh, to think about how to support others as artists and designers in this space um, through, you know, visual design. And so this, these are just a few images of um, iterations of the Black Woman is God in the title wall. Um, I think this one's from 2016. And then a, a more recent sort of iteration um, that I was experimenting with and was just really kind of at the time, I think Black Klansmen had come out and I was just interested in this like kind of pushing of the typography and a um, sort of a retro kind of condensed uppercase uh, Black exploitation way. Um, and so I was inspired by that sort of typographically um, as a direction for, uh, I think this was the 2018 iteration or 2019 iteration um, for the Black Woman is God Assembly of Gods. And so again, it's like thinking about how to push beyond expected colors, expected tropes, seeing what is possible typographically um, to support the exhibition um, that others might be working on and, and it being in service to. And so, you know, post school, like these are some of the projects that I was engaged in um, as a practicing designer. Um, and then, you know, kind of moving from this sort of space to, oops, did I go back? I think I went backwards, sorry there. Um, moving to this space to another sort of uh, area of my practice, um, there's this sort of deep research around Black visual culture. And for me, that can mean a lot of things, right? Black visual culture, in my mind, is actually looking at a lot of print media and looking at representations of Black people um, that have per, uh, particularly been featured in, in promotional advertisements. That's kind of where I'm sort of looking at, at these, these days. And so one sort of ongoing project that I have is called Depictions of Blackness in American Graphic Design. And um, what I've been doing is really looking at um, old film posters from the 20s and 30s, many of whom have been directed by Oscar Michaud. Um, and I was just somehow came across a book that was called Separate Cinema, that is a collection of all of these different uh, film posters that specifically represent Black film. And, uh, and they go from, you kind of chronolog, uh, it chronolizes from like, you know, the early 1900s to kind of present day. But when I was flipping through the books, I'd never come across these before. And I was just struck by, you know, the, the typography, the imagery, um, you know, thinking about what these, how these might have appeared in the world. And I wanted to do something with them. And so I, um, you know, started to kind of disassemble and reassemble, which is a part of my practice, um, and really kind of am interested in deconstructing and finding elements from, you know, original sources. Like again, in this one, same thing, the girl from Chicago, I was interested in isolating sort of these elements, um, really trying to find race represented in the, in the design work itself. I think that's something that I'm always constantly trying to unpack is like, how is race actually spelled out or in linguistically put into the works. Um, and then I created a series of like uh, risograph prints that were kind of inspired by those elements. And so they look like they're of the time, but they're actually kind of more kind of like um, exploratory experiments of, you know, thinking about um, how can I put these all together and have them appear as though they are of the same time. Um, and, and also really looking at like, stupendous all-star Negro motion picture. Like that was language that was used and trying to think through what that means um, in this present context. And so part of my practice, again, away from some of the more commercial work where I'm working with other people in, in my independent practice, I'm really kind of thinking about these kinds of things as well. And it just kind of pushing the experiments um, and layering and texture and all of those kinds of things. So these are just a few images of that kind of process. Um, and then the last two projects I'll share um, are, you know, that, that leg of my practice is about, you know, publishing, um, you know, in a way Kindred was really such a, 
it was such a foundational project because that publication, the Kindred booklet, as small as it was, was really kind of a precursor to this project, which is called the Black, Brown, and Latinx Design Educators. And so, um, uh, let's see, I think it was 2019, I, you know, was selected to participate in the College Art Association Conference. Um, I had pitched an idea to do a panel that was about um, featuring, you know, panelists who identified as being Black, Brown, and of Latinx communities, and really specifically thinking about how graphic design educators were navigating the types of institutions they were at, um, the types of work they were making, challenges that they were facing in academia. And uh, through that panel, I ended up getting a chance to meet a, a whole bunch of designers. And I, in preparation for the panel, I was like, I think I need to get to know everybody. Let me interview everyone so I can kind of know who, you know, some people I knew well, and then other people who I selected for the panel, I didn't know at all. And so um, this, is an image of like all of us at the panel um, at February, 2020, pre like the last panel before the pandemic hit. And it was like, okay, you can't go anywhere. And thankfully these were the, the most amazing people that I was able to meet in person, um, you know, just before the pandemic shut everything down. Um, but uh, pretty much everyone in the image, except Ali, who is also included in the book, which is a classmate of mine from RISD here is also featured in the book um are all of the designers that I interviewed and uh, as the project sort of unfolded I realized how much content I was actually navigating and, and um you know shaping and so I pulled in Iana Martin Diaz who's here uh was my co-designer on the book um is now hardcore RISD community as well also Parsons shout out to Parsons as well um uh, alum that she is and so um, this book uh, was an opportunity for me to uh, share some of the stories and share some of the, um, the different struggles and challenges that many of us were facing both as students as we kind of made our way through as students and kind of made our way through um, as educators and still kind of navigating. And so um, the book includes uh, that sort of dialogue that I have with, with all of the educators and, and intermittently kind of interspersed throughout are sort of passages that they shared with me about race um, that I also included. And so, you know, some are from designers, some are from, you know, sociologists and political theorists about race. Um, and, you know, again, it kind of weaves through the arc of the, the book you know, these kind of moments where we're having challenging questions, asking about like, what are the hierarchies? What does it mean to go to school here or there? How, how are you, um, you know, how are your environments kind of shaping who you are? How are your upbringings um, shaping who you are? Um, again, a shout out to Ramon Tejada, another RISD uh, person in the mix who's in this book as well um, in graphic design. And, you know, this is just an image of uh, his family and, and I think what made the book really significant for me is that it got personal and it got deep. Um, and it also kind of was cross-cultural in a lot of ways. I was learning a lot it, linguistically across language, across, um, you know, all of our different sort of backgrounds. And it was just an opportunity kind of to, to weave our conversation about design with who we are as people. And so this last slide here is just an image from my dad's uh, passport. And I, I always include it because it's like, it's canceled. Is he canceled Jamaican or is it like, what is what does that mean? Even though it's not valid anymore, but is it like, is it valid? Like, what are these, how, how do we understand that, I guess? Um, and, and so again, throughout the book are, are definitely like really uh, great stories and interesting sort of insights and I encourage all of you to take a look if you haven't already um, to get that book. And then because I'm always on the move, the next book um, that I'm working on that is a co-authored book is called The Black Experience in Design. Um, and so, you know, again, it's been uh, just kind of pushing through um, what I have felt is all of the community that I've kind of met through Black, uh, Brown and Latinx design educators 
has created such a really great foundation for me to connect with other collaborators. And so um, I am now excited now, I can actually share this book is about to drop in February, 2022. Um, and it's co-authored with Ann H. Berry and uh, Kareem Kali, Penny Laker, Leslie Ann Knoll, Jennifer Rittner and myself. And Ann and Jennifer are such great friends of mine now that we, you know, it's exciting to kind of move from one project where they were featured in my other book to this one is now working as collaborators, as co-authors. This super excited about because um, it includes 50 contributors, all Black designers across the spectrum of different types of practice. Um, and it's, it's sort of an extended kind of uh, extension of, you know, similar things that I was doing in my own book. Um, but to do it in collaboration and in community and, co you know, commiseration even, right, and, and sort of annoyance uh, to have them be with me on this journey to create this book has been such a valued uh, experience. And just some sneak peeks of it that are in progress. Um, these are some sneak peek spreads that are still in, in the works. Um, our book designer for this is Renaud Boussant, who was another former, design, uh, former student of mine um, while I was working at UConn, Black designer, killer designer. So if you ever need another designer, <laughs> reach out to Renaud, so shout out to him. Um, but he is helping to kind of shape how the book is coming together. And so these are just some of the uh, interior spreads um, as we've been kind of navigating what we're looking for or trying to have in this book. Um, and, and again, just one note is just having conversations still uh, are really critical for me as a designer um, to know and learn and grow, um, you know, what people are doing and how people are making. And so there's a really great conversation that I have with Nancy Matiti, um, which will be great to read once that's out. But um, I think with that, I just want to say thank you um, for, like I said, hearing me sharing out the work that I'm doing and the journey that I've been on. Uh, so I'll pause there um, and stop my screen from sharing. Fantastic, Kelly. I mean, just a wealth of, of things that you've been up to um, that's really important for this conversation, but just important for the world, right? Uh, before we get into our Q&A session, uh, what I would like to first do is give you the opportunity to share with people where can they purchase the, your book, um, the one that is currently out, um, so that we make sure people who don't have it can get it. Yes. So, Sky, uh, I'm going to put the the latest book in the chat. Um, okay. And I think you can do pre-order for this one. And then the other one, let's see, I'll put that in. But yeah, I'm, I'll just pull that up. But if you have a question for me, I'll try to like do it at the okay. same time. <laughs> okay, wonderful. Um, great. And for those who um, are probably going to be listening to this in a rebroadcast, um, where I'm going to well, I will, I will say, I'll ask this question. If you can audibly share, where are, where can they find um, that? Is it like on Amazon? Is it on your website? Um, uh, as you oh, yeah. are pulling that link up. Yeah. Yeah. Princeton Architectural Press is for um, my book, which I'm trying to grab the link okay. and like not fast enough. Um, okay. I think I got it. And then here's this one. Okay. So Princeton Architectural Press, everyone who's listening, make sure you write that down um, yeah. and go and cop that and get that book. Um, awesome. Well, I would actually like to, to jump into our questions uh, that I have for you. Um, and speaking of one of the things that you mentioned in your presentation is how in your books, uh, essentially going, um, getting more personal uh, and getting deep uh, through conversation. And so I'd like to get that opportunity to do that a little bit with you uh, here uh, with the time that we have left. So first off, um, where in the world are you currently and why did you move there? 
So I'm in Stamford, Connecticut, which is actually where I grew up. Um, and I think I'm like, I've moved around a lot in the last few years. And it, what's nice is being back home and near family. So I think for me, what was really critical and essential, um, you know, after being in a lot of different places was being close to, to home and close to family. Um, so that's where yeah. I am. Yeah. Awesome. And what was it that prompted you to say, hey, I want to give RISD a chance. I want to go there and get my MFA. What was it about RISD? What was it about the time that you were in or what you were pursuing that prompted you to decide to choose RISD for uh, the pursuit of your of your master's? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I am like my undergrad experience was a, a really strong one. And I'm grateful for, um, you know, the designers that I learned under um, while I was at UConn, which is where I went to, to undergrad. And um, one of my former designers actually just passed away, Edvin Yeager. And he, he Mark Zarolo, and uh, I think at the time, Randall Hoyt were the three that were kind of leading the, the program um, in graphic design. And it was kind of on its, you know, it was being reshaped and formed while I was there. And, and I think uh, what I felt like I learned a lot about during that sort of that formative time about what design was, was that there, we were kind of intersecting in, inside of a fine arts program. And so it was, it was many things like you could be you know, making a logo, but you could also be doing watercolor or the logo could be watercolor, right? Like there was this, a way of seeing that was really fluid. And I, um, you know, every time I think back about that now, like I think about the significance of that and, you know, how impressionable it, it was for me at that time. And then when I graduated, I was like, oh, like, what do I do next? And so it was a lot of figuring that out as many people are and continue to do. And it was through that period, though, that I also started teaching also through another former designer who uh, former design educator who, you know, invited me to teach um, fairly early. And and I really liked the balance of still being in an academic context and like also um, having kind of a, a commercial practice at the same time. And so I, it was through that kind of being still connected to an academic space that I was like, I think I still want to go back. To school, I want to kind of pursue further study. I want to deepen kind of what um, types of projects are really, really calling to me. And, and I think when I was looking at different sort of options, I, you know, had looked at a range of different schools. Um, and I think in terms of like why I ultimately chose RISD was like, it was that hybrid connection to both art and design at the same time that I really loved. And not every program um, sort of looks like that or kind of operates like that. Um, and so it felt the closest to what I was really looking for, where I could be in a few different spaces and be in dialogue with, um, you know, both artists and designers or hybrids or anything yeah. or a maker, whatever you want to call yourself. You yeah. know, <laughs> I like that part of it um, a lot. Oh, that's fantastic. And after making that decision in your time um, there, uh, if you could think of at least one, I'm sure there are many more than just one, but at least one memorable moment during your time at RISD. A memorable, uh, in what context? What, what do we mean? <laughs> like, a um, so that, so that could be however you choose whatever, what comes to mind. It could be in the context of, you know, um, your, your experience as, um, as a uh, grad student, it could be your experience in being, um, uh, being in the Providence area, right? Like, okay. you know, and being on campus, right? It's really up to you. What is okay. sort of one memorable, and we'll, we'll dig yeah. a little deeper in, in, in the other piece that you might be sort of asking okay. about, but uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But I mean, I think, to you. I think the most mem memorable sort of experience is that I, I was fortunate to come through at a time where my class, my cohort was very close. 
Um, many of us are very connected still today. And like I just saw two last week, you know, I'm probably seeing two more next week. Um, I think that I was really, um, I, I really appreciated the community that, you know, especially, especially in the, the grad space that both while I was in school and now after, you know, being an alumni now, that the network is very strong and that there's, um, you know, uh, a really close connection I, I personally feel to to all of my classmates. Um, and so I think the memorable moments are like just being in the studio and like trying to hustle on a project and it's due the next day and late hours in the studio or going to like, I think was it gourmet heaven is what it used to be called or serendipity or something in off from the CIT building. Um, you know, just like in that literal like one block radius of going from, you know, onto Westminster and and I, I just I love and then going to Small Point for sandwiches and chips and things. So like those things to me are like I, I have vivid memories and like just trying to get food before class or after class, those kinds of things. Um, yeah, that's a memory, I would, I would say. say. Yeah, I would say I would share some of those from my time being at Rizzi. It always has to, many of them revolve around food and uh, <laughs> late nights <laughs> and trying to squeeze in things before projects. Um, uh, I, I could share plenty, but it's not about me right now. So um, my next question for you, as I want to dig a little bit deeper as your work uh, dives into this topic so much and so I'm, I'm really excited that I, I am having this conversation with you specifically because of the, what, the fact that your work uh, dives in specifically as it relates to Black identity, Black identity as it relates to designers. And so what I wanted to ask you is, what did it mean being Black at RISD? What did it mean? Um, yeah. I think it, it meant that you were one of few. I think it meant that we were spread out um, it, it meant that we, in some, some, some instances, were really isolated from each other. Uh, it meant that you were seeking, you know, trying to find feedback that was, you know, from Black faculty or, or you know, faculty of color. It meant, you know, trying to take classes at Brown and seeing if that would also work, like on race, class, and gender. I had a class that, you know, it was the, at that time was the first black professor I had ever had um, at, at the graduate level or educator, you know, and I think I was really, you know, processing that. And that wasn't even at RISD that was at Brown. Um, I think I, you know, at the same time was interested in meeting other people. And, and, and I think because of that isolation, and so I just felt it was really important that as a, as a process to avoid continuing to feel isolated, that I, you know, extend out and to see like what was happening um, in, in these different spaces. And I think like GSA, I think was like one of the, the grad student alliance, I think it, it's called, like there were certain events that were put on that you got to kind of meet people. There were, um, what was the other thing that like, I think it's like uh, not open hours, but there would be like these evenings where open studios, that's what it was, open studios on, um, on the fine art side where you kind of like walk through rooms and meet people. And so I think it meant that like, I was in constant pursuit of looking for something and finding something. That's what it meant to me. Um, and would you say that, that that pursuit of looking, did that play, what role did that play in your, in your present day work and in the publications that you've, you've put out? The, the constant looking? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think, it's, I think it's why I was like, oh, there's still more, there's still more. I think that's like, yeah. it, it's, I think that's the piece is like, I did, you know, one book, but I was like, there's still more. And there's only like 12 people in this book. And like, that's, it's such a small sampling. I, I, I say that. And I write that in the, in the preface that I'm like, this is just a really tiny sampling of people. It's not the world. And it's right. just providing a, a small window in some ways, but 
that there are so many other experiences. There's so many other things I don't know. Um, there's so many kind of nuances within design practice that I don't know as well. And just, I feel like that, um, for me was just like a way of continuing to learn. Um, yeah. I think that's kind of like how I, I think that's how it kind of informs like the way that I'm working now. Yeah. Yeah. I, I love the fact that, that, that pursuit of looking, um, being a part of a minority within the institution has lended itself and become the catalyst to your continued uh, pursuit that has been a benefit for many people reading and picking up your publication out and hearing these other voices whom they may not have ever heard of or the experiences that they have to share that you have brought to surface um, through uh, through your engagement with them, through your conversations uh, with them. So that's, that's, for me, just an awesome sort of like connecting point um, of how that took place. Um, and I, I wonder, I want to kind of dig a little deeper in this area of sort of what it means to be Black at RISD and ask this other question uh, that gets, gets really heavy, but how have you ever had an experience while at RISD that made you uncomfortable because of your race? Mm, that made me uncomfortable. Um, yeah. I think sometimes, oh, oh yes. <laughs> there it I'm is. Like, I'm like, I'm like, there it is. Okay. And I actually was reminded of by my friend Jamar, who is like one of the only other, like there, at the time that I was there, there were like four black graphic designers um, in one of the years that I was there. And then it became myself and Jamar um, who were there. And he, I just spoke to him last week and he reminded me of this situation. So, um, there was a class that I had where uh, I think we were taking a trip to Boston. And so we, um, you know, went to the uh, train station and we were waiting on the platform, waiting on the platform with the, the entire class. And uh, it was, um, I don't know, I, I don't even remember, I don't even remember what we were going to see, but I just know that the entire class was on the platform. And my hair, was a, like an Afro that day. So I, you know, sometimes move from braids to, you know, Afro or anything in between, twist, whatever. At the time I had an Afro and I had picked it out and it was kind of out a little bit further than it is right here. And I remember standing, talking to someone, I think it was Jamar at the time. And then we were saying something and then a classmate reached over and touched my hair. Like we weren't even in conversation. She wasn't talking to me. We, she just was like, wow, it's just so soft, right? Just hand out, touch the hair. I was just like, she did not, like did, <laughs> she did not just do this. And I, I like, it took me a minute to like process like what was happening. And I was, I was so oh, pissed. Goodness. I was just like, also what? Like, I am not like, I am not this like touchable object that you have not gotten consent to kind of just reach out and touch my hair. And because of that, it became a project that was called, yeah. can, I touch, <laughs> can I touch your hair? And, and I think it was, a, it was, it, it was that tension of like, because no one had ever seen hair like this or had encountered a black woman with hair like this. Like there were instances that happened like that, where it would be, you know, obviously really objectified. And, and I felt like, you know, how do I respond to this? You can respond in the moment, but sometimes you're still bitter afterwards. Right. And so I was just like, just kind of sitting in that. And I think there was a project that I, I, I don't know what studio class it was for. I, I don't even remember at the time, but I ended up making this like iPad experience where I went through like magazines and found like different hairstyles like of black women and like made this interactive experience. And it, it, um, it was like my way of kind of dealing with that kind of tension and turning it into some kind of work. But I think that just generally, I think that those types of moments where you're the very first black person friend, that happened to me a lot in undergrad. I, I experienced it all the time. 
of, you know, those types of situations where I would be the, the, the first of, you know, whatever, whatever. And, and I think, um, you know, I think what it made me do is think about like how to be quick in my response in the moment, how to be reactionary, how to be reactionary later, how to hit people up later and be like, also no. So like, you know, give my own self time to reflect on what just happened and come to it with a very um, specific response later that it doesn't need to be um, always exactly in that same second, but that you can have a delay and then come back with a very critical response um, in it. Yeah. So I think that that's yeah. like some of the things that I kind of navigated. Yeah, that's, wow. Um, so many things about that. <laughs> <laughs> As you can see me cringe, <laughs> um, you know, uh, from that experience and, and, and myself as well, um, having to learn how to, what is the best way and to, to find language to address that in the moment, um, you know, when, when you are the first for, for many people. I've had someone I remember, and I just told some of this the other day, um, that my, my freshman year at RISD, someone um, came up to me, I was talking with the, the with one of the students and and uh, he said to me towards the end of our conversation he's like Vincent you're the first black person I've seen in real life oh wow. and I was frozen I was frozen I like I was absolutely frozen I, I thought he, I laughed at first because I was like haha you're just kidding he's like no no seriously and I was just like actually that that's possible if for me it was just the wildest thing that somebody could have ever said to me, but, um, you know, so I can relate in that oftentimes being sort of like the first, you know, yeah. to, you know, the, 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 the black experience. Um, so switching gears a little bit, uh, what was the first job that you got as, um, the first year after, uh, graduation? I know you, you mentioned it, um, but is, was there, uh, something else prior to you getting back into education or, or yeah, what was I mean, it? That... I'll, I'll say there were like kind of two different breaks. I think out of undergrad, right. my first job was like, I was the marketing and design associate at a local Y. Um, and I was like making flyers, the pool was closed and like, like, you know, <laughs> it, like, uh, you know, these little trifle pamphlets that had the pool schedule or the swimming schedules right so like out of yeah. grad like I started you know working part-time in this kind of way and um and so like that was like first out of undergrad and then out of grad school um I had been nominated for an ACAB fellowship and that was a, a really great opportunity to kind of like um be a full-time faculty at, at California College of the Arts um, and so that's when I, you know, leaving Rhode Island, basically, and moving to Oakland, I like did that right after school. Um, so that was like my, the first job out of grad school. Awesome. Awesome. Um, how did you learn about that opportunity? Well, Bethany Johns. <laughs> 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 uh, I don't I, I got an email from Bethany about it and then I ended up applying um but yeah my program director and so um I think that's how I learned about that particular program awesome awesome so good um and how has RISD we talked a little bit about this and I pointed it out in, in terms of your pursuit being on the RISD being on the RISD campus and then hey, how it shows up in your work. Um, but if you can speak to any other ways in which RISD has prepared you for the work that you're currently doing, what are those? Oh, um, it, I think it's prepared me, it, it prepared me to think bigger. I think, um, you know, when I first came into school, I, I think uh, at RISD specifically, um, you know, I think I was thinking in, in, a, in a more smaller, I would say just a smaller context around like what design could be. And I think, um, 
what I learned a lot through all the classes and there were like amazing guest lectures that would come, um, all of these different speakers or workshops that were kind of, um, you know, had around campus. I think what I learned through that is that like, I could be thinking bigger and I could, you know, try to push for more. And I, and I think that that like, even the symposium and the publication for, for the, uh, exhibition kindred was an example of that. Like I was like, oh, can I do this? I guess we'll see. And let's push and try. And I think it was through those kinds of like trial and error and like thinking bigger that it, um, you know, even with this, my Black, Brown, and Latinx uh, design educators book, like I was really only going to make a pamphlet. That book in my mind, wow. or what, what I thought it was going to be was like me talking to every, uh, you know, panelist and then putting together maybe some quotes into like what might have been like a zine or a pamphlet, something very small, right? I, I, that's where I had started. And then it was through, you know, reading these conversations back that I was like, this is more than a paragraph. This is more than just a quote. <laughs> And so it was in those, in that moment where I was like, it can be more. And I think my ability to be like, yes, I think I can try to do this and to expand out um, is possible. And I think the other thing that I thought was really key was that I can reach out to people to help and be collaborators on in this pursuit. And so I think, you know, for that book project, again, it wouldn't have come together without my, you know, co-designer Iana. And I think you know, so being in collaboration with people is so critical that I think even for the the most recent book that I'm working on, um, you know, it needed to be in collaboration. Like I, I am a sole black person. Like I have had a very one sort of journey experience, but to be in conversation with multiple black designers, thinking about a book that features more black designers was really yeah. key. Um, and I and I think, you know, again, another small sampling, even 50 is a small sample. Like it's just a yeah. small sample of people. But um, I think in either case, I think it was, I feel like I'm I'm fueled by the support of others and and I think fueled by their support to think we can build bigger. Um, and I think yeah. it's through that kind of thinking um, that I felt like I learned a lot about that uh, as a grad student. That's wonderful. That's so good. Um, before we get into questions, because I do want to see if there are any questions, I have my final question for you, which is, what is the one thing that you would say to your first year self at RISD or your final year self at RISD? So you choose Ooh. or both? Oh, first year self. Uh, of course, final year self. Um, man, I don't, this is a good, tough, very tough question. <laughs> uh, I feel like for the final year self, I think to trust in what you have learned to trust in what your skills are um that I would probably tell myself at that point when I was like graduating because it was a that was a scary time I'm like you're, you're like moving cross country you're like kind of starting over in a lot of ways and I think what I would continue to tell myself I did it but then like I think what I would have told myself to kind of even be less anxious would would be to trust the skills and the things that I've learned. Um, and that if, <laughs> I guess if that version of myself then knew that it, things that I was making or would inform things that I would continue to make, you know, I probably be like, you know, more uh, or less, less uncertain, I should say. Um, but that things will cycle through again in some form and it will be okay. I think that's what I would tell myself. <laughs> Yeah, I think, I think transitioning, and I think that's a really wonderful uh, statement and, and piece of advice to share, 
to yourself at that time. And for those students who are here and those who will be listening to this, you know, um, I concur with that, you know, being able to trust in your both your formal education at RISD, but also the experience of being on campus and, and collaborating with others and just learning about self in the process um, that that is enough to get you to that next step in, in the journey. And I love that. So thank you for sharing that. Um, thank you so much, Kelly. Do not go anywhere just yet. I really do appreciate you taking the time to share with us, to share your stories, to share your experience for us to get to know you a little bit more. And now I'd like to open it up to those who are here. If you have any questions, please throw them in the chat so both uh, Kelly and I can see them and uh, uh, she can answer them. Uh, and as those questions are getting typed, if they are, I do want to let everyone uh, know that we will be having some time after um, this uh, formal piece of tonight um, where we can have just a, a, a conversation with you all about, um, you know, whatever it is that you want to talk about as it relates to what Kelly has shared and some, you know, things that are on your mind, perhaps. So once that happens um, at the end, uh, as Danielle has put into the chat, uh, the recording will stop um, so that uh, we can we can move into that space. But uh, um, before we do that, um, actually, yeah, uh, Danielle, that's um, we can we can go ahead and and move into that. If there are no questions uh, that people have, we can go ahead and stop recording, and then we can just sort of open it up and just have real talk, if you will. <laughs>